biodiversity, the variety of life. E.O. Wilson says, we should preserve every scrap of biodiversity as priceless. While we learn to use it and come to understand what it means to humanity. Welcome to Adventures in Citizen Science, Technology, Conservation, and Saving the World! <laughs> I'm Brickin, and that was a long title. <laughs> Let me explain. I'm getting my master's with the Dragonfly program through Miami University of Ohio. And for our first semester last year, we had class, and every class we would meet a conservation expert. And we would go around the room and we would introduce ourselves. And the first time I said, Hi, I'm Brickin. I run the wildlife theater program, and I, I want to use theater to teach about science. And I felt silly and inadequate. I'm in a room filled with conservation experts and professors and animal keepers and even a lawyer. And here I am, oh, I'm a theater girl. <laughs> so the second time I introduced myself, I said, hello, my name is Brickin. I run the wildlife theater program. And my goal is to use theater to connect children to conservation and help save the world. <laughs> it got a little laugh from my fellow students, so I said it every time. But what started as a joke began to ring true to me. Not that I can save the world, but that what we do all together and all the people that we reach, we really can save the world. And the world needs us right now. The biodiversity of planet Earth is immense, and scientists have had trouble quantifying it. They've been trying to figure out the number of species on the planet since at least the 1800s. And uh, Dr. Strain has the latest number, and I quote, 8.7 million species, give or take a million. <laughs> <laughs> Nearly 9 million, and we're still discovering. However, Professor Richard Primack has some grim news for us. He talks about the rate of new species development compared to species extinction. And he says that now, for every one new species, a hundred go extinct. Primex suggests that this might actually be an underestimation, that the rate might be as bad as one to 1,000. I think we can all do the math on that and see where that leaves biodiversity. But why should I care? What does it mean to me or you? Doctors Clayton and Apatow researched this and wondered how people connect to nature, and they write that each person has an environmental identity that can be encouraged to grow. When nature can be connected to the individual, the individual feels an internal motivation to act. I must say, I have a pretty big environmental identity, and it just grows every time I step outside. Here's a good story about it. This last winter, I went to San Simeon, California, with my husband to see the <coughs> elephant seal rookeries. And this was incredible. It was like stepping onto a, a nature TV show and seeing it all live in front of you. You hear the elephant seals before you see them. The females uh, sort of make this noise, and the pups make this noise, and the males make this noise, that one's harder to imitate. But you realize that all these boulders that you see on the beach aren't boulders at all, the elephant seals, and they are everywhere you can see to the left and to the right and they are so close you can practically lean your hand over the railing and reach out and touch one of them which is not advised <laughs> they're wild and they have teeth so you don't but as you watch this this soap opera reveals itself to you the females are uh, sort of sunning themselves on the beach and they're feeding the pups and the males have something else in mind they know 
that very soon after the females have the pups, they're ready to breed again. And they are on it. Uh, the successful males are already surrounded by their harem and they stand proud in the sun. And the uh, lesser males are sort of on the ocean's edge. And they do the strangest thing. They, they lay out on the beach and they make this sort of worming, creaking <laughs> motion the whole time trying to reach a female. And they creep, and they creep. And every now and then they sort of lift up like this. As if to say, nothing to see here. <laughs> and then they creep, and then they creep, and then, creep, and then their long noses touch a female, and it is chaos. <laughs> and if that doesn't frighten the male away, the alpha male, who can weigh up to 4,500 pounds, charge us. 4,000 pounds of blubber smashing into each other. I mean, these elephant seal males are huge, like horror movie huge, and all the males have scars from all their previous battles. And all this is happening while the little teeny tiny pups are just trying to get some milk. <laughs> and the nature show doesn't end there. They're seagulls, and they have a very important job. They have to eat all the placenta left over from the birth, and they are getting that beach clean. And the vultures are there too, and they have to do their important job. Not every elephant seal makes it every year. It's grim, but when in life do you get to see an entire food web acted out before your very eyes? This is what motivates me, this majesty of biodiversity. And the good news is, there's a lot we can do. There are citizen science actions that we can participate in, and technology can actually help animals. Even while it's distracting us as we're playing Candy Crush and checking in on Facebook. Citizen science, that, that word I've heard a lot, but nobody took the time to define it for me. I mean, obviously I can assume it's people doing science. But I think that Michael Novak explains it really nicely. He says, citizen science invites the public to participate in science research and conservation action. It allows the participants to work with scientists and be a part of the results. I like that. That's tangible. It's empowering. And for this semester, we all participated in a citizen science action. Now, I have always liked birds, and particularly bluebirds. I'm very interested in them. They're beautiful, and they have a lot of trouble with invasive species birds. So I thought a birding opportunity would be a good one for me. So I selected the Great Backyard Bird Count, which is run by the Audubon Society and the Cornell Lab. And this opportunity is, is fantastic and very easy. All you need is access to the internet. And the website is so easy. You just sort of link in your name, and an entire page is developed just for you in an instant. And you can put in all your birding information on there. And when you're done, it actually creates spreadsheets for you so you can look at all that you've learned. And all this information is collected and added to all the other citizen scientists who participated. And this year, over 100,000 birders participated. And these people came from all over the world. And then all this information we gathered is given to the scientists. And they can now look for trends and red flags. Uh, did a species number decline? Was migration pattern a little off this year? And from that, they can develop new scientific research. And I helped me and 100,000 other people. <laughs> and participating in this, it really excited me. I birded all four days of the count, and it was in February, so we all know how cold that was. <laughs> and I might have made a few rookie mistakes, but I was enthusiastic. Day one, I headed out to do my bird count. It was seven degrees, so I wore my bear hat to keep myself warm, <laughs> and I took my iPhone to take pictures and to take notes. Now, and I rushed out there. Are there any birders in the audience? What did I forget? 
Binoculars. My binoculars. I sure did. I went out on my first day of birding without any of the equipment I really needed. But I still managed to do a good job. And I was taking notes, and then my iPhone turned itself off because it was too cold. Okay, day two, I would learn my lesson. I would bring my binoculars and my notepad and my pen and my iPhone and he went to take pictures. And I saw the cutest group of birds all fighting for seeds. There were um, little house sparrows and cardinals and blue jays and tit mice, and they were all having a merry little time fighting over these seeds. And I'm frantically trying to count them. They won't stand still, one, two, <laughs> three. And then suddenly they disappear. And I'm looking around to see what happened. And right above my head is a red-tailed hawk. <gasps> and you can almost imagine it had a bib and a fork and a knife. <laughs> I took a picture so I could share it with you. And uh, it didn't really come out. He just looked like a brown bag or something hanging from the tree. <laughs> Note, bring a better camera. So, day three, I had every piece of birding equipment you could possibly ever need. And I got out there and it was five degrees and there was this little downy woodpecker that was circling me and he tried to land on my shoulder <gasps> twice. And because I had my better camera, there he is! Aww. Very cute, Aww. very cute. Uh, day four, it was four degrees. Mm. <laughs> but that wasn't what happened that was a problem. The problem happened when I saw a bird that I had never seen. I saw this cute little sparrow, and I took a picture of it, and I rushed it home so that I could compare it with the website. And uh, it was striped and kind of fluffy that was rooting around in the snow. I matched it up with the pictures on the website. Nothing matched. I checked three other websites, and I couldn't quite find a picture of the bird that I had taken a picture of. And this is where I worry about online citizen science actions because I'm not a bird expert, I, I really didn't know what the bird was. A lesser birder might have just guessed and put any old thing onto the website, but I'm not like that. <laughs> so I posted my photo onto Facebook and I tagged all my birder friends. And thanks to Tom, Lily, Jen, and Michael, we were able to ID it as a song sparrow. Maybe not a big deal to other people, but to me, it was. There she is. She was so cute. There are so many fantastic birding citizen science actions. I, I mentioned bluebirds earlier. Bluebirds have a lot of trouble fighting for nesting spots with house sparrows. House sparrows were introduced to America in the 1800s by Europeans for two reasons. One, they were trying to fight beetles that were eating crops. They thought house sparrows would help. And two, a few people just missed house sparrows. They loved them so much, so they brought them from Europe with them. Well, little did they know that the house sparrow in 50 years would take over all of America. And it turns out house sparrows are lucky, and they fight for nesting spots. And this is a big problem for the eastern bluebird. Adair Gottway did a research study on this. And he found that some house sparrows take over bluebird nests by destroying any eggs they find and killing the parents when they return. One nest was found with the house sparrow's nesting material built up over the bodies of the adult bluebirds. I know, it's pretty awful. But before the house sparrow becomes the villain of this story, remember who brought the house sparrow here. Now, you can do something. Don't worry. It's not all that grim. You can participate in actions by the North American Bluebird Society, Bluebird Conservation, and nestwatch.com. And let's try not to feed the house sparrows if we can help it. <laughs> As my environmental identity has grown, I can't help but turn from local issues to global issues. What can I do? In a bigger picture, where can I help other than my own backyard? And so I've been doing a lot about the 96 elephant campaign. Uh, in this campaign, we're concerned with African elephants and rhinoceroses being poached for their ivory. I was lucky enough to create a play about it last summer. 
to help families connect to the issues in the 96 Elephants Campaign. This campaign is run by the Wildlife Conservation Society, and it is to address this statistic. 96 elephants are killed each day in Africa. At this rate, there will be no wild African elephants by the year 2025. The price of ivory has skyrocketed in response to high demand. Most of the new demand is coming from China, where ivory is fashionable as trinkets and knickknacks and jewelry. Additionally alarming, many journalists now believe that profits from a lot of this new wave of poaching is going to fund terrorist groups. Often when I hear people talk about these issues, you hear them say things like, oh, we have to save the planet for my grandchildren. No more wild African elephants by 2025. It's not let's save the elephants for the next generation. It's let's save the elephants for us. Can we live in a planet where we watch elephants go extinct in the wild? No. Of course not. It's unacceptable. But what can be done? Well, hope is out there in the form of a very controversial technology. Drones. Yeah, the same drones that we are uncomfortable when they are used for war or perhaps even to invade our privacy. Drone technology, or UAV as they call it, may just be the best tool against this new wave of poaching. Scientists at the University of Maryland's Institute for Advanced Computer Studies, led by Dr. Tom Snitch, have created a predictive software. It communicates with UAVs, satellites, and rangers who are on the ground, and it finds poachers before they act. This predictive formula includes information like phases of the moon, nearness to roads, movements of animals and humans. This information is then added to satellite images that are current. And the UAVs are sent to areas predicted to attract poachers. <coughs> and then the rangers move in and follow the UAVs. The UAVs then provide real-time images. They even are built with infrared cameras. And these images are sent to the rangers who move in and stop the poaching before it happens. Yeah. Does it work? This program has been in place for two years in a section of South Africa. And Dr. Tom Snitch reports that in every place they have implemented the UAV program, within a week's time, poaching stops. The Lindbergh Foundation is supporting this program under the name Air Shepherds. And they're trying to fundraise for another seven African countries to put these drones in the air, and the seven countries are welcoming the program. The Lindbergh Foundation reports that in one area where the system is being used to protect rhinos, there has been zero poaching during the six months the project has been operating. Wow. This program is the best of the modern world. Our latest technology paired with caring conservationists, a glimmer of hope so what can we do next? Well, first, thank you for coming. And after the show, you can come up here and you can look through all my research. You can even take some of it home if you want. And those of you watching on the World Wide Web, I'm going to put all this information on conservation theater trends on Facebook and on Tumblr. But we can do more. How about next year? We all participate in the Great Backyard Bird Count together. But if you want to do something right now, you can't wait till next year. Be a part of Frog Watch, or the Journey North, or volunteer at your local zoo, or aquarium, or nature center. <laughs> and if you want to donate, please consider Air Shepherd or the 96 Elephant Campaign. Remember, together, we can save the world. Thank you. <laughs>